my name is Jeff Jordan with Rescue, and I'm going to talk to you. We're going to dive deep into that teen segmentation that I showed during yesterday's morning keynote. Um, and for those of you that have ever seen this data before, um, uh, we have some brand new data we're showing uh, I'm going to share with you today. So, um, and if you haven't, we're going to share the, the good old stuff as well. So, so let's jump right in. When we started working in tobacco control about 15, 16 years ago, um, the first thing we did was we looked at how the tobacco industry was doing their work. And what we learned from how the tobacco industry was doing their work was that it was all very targeted, very segmented, very focused on lifestyles. Different brands were targeting different groups of people. We saw that there were certain brands that were targeting country culture. Um, things like Skull and Marlboro and Copenhagen um, were all showing kind of the manly, rugged man that used these products. And they were trying to associate those products and those behaviors with that lifestyle. But then we saw other brands like Newports and Cools that were associating urban lifestyles and hip hop lifestyles with using menthol products, um, all by design, right? The tobacco industry decided that that's who they were, they were gonna sell those products to. Um, and then even further, we saw other brands like Camel and Natural American Spirits targeting alternative teens, uh, alternative people, working with rock bands and things like that. And so we said, this was really our initial kind of guiding light that said, look, this is how the tobacco industry is convincing people to start smoking. So what are we doing in these same spaces with these same lifestyles, images, identities uh, to, to combat smoking? And that's where kind of all the, all the segmentation concepts and models uh, originated from. We started understanding that who you are uh, can motivate beh behavior more powerfully than what you know. And the tobacco industry, you, you can even read some of their documents that say that they knew all the health education that was happening in schools. And they were pretty much saying, we don't care because we know that we're, we're convincing them that to be cool, you need to smoke. And that that was like a different part of the brain. It didn't even matter. These kids were still going to smoke because there was no one challenging the notion that you needed smoke to be cool. So we took all that information and said, all right, well, what is the segmentation that we're seeing? What are the groups that we see when we go into schools, when we do our research with teens? And so our peer crowd segmentation model, um, we did not come up with the concept of peer crowds, but we've certainly built on, on, what we, on what's been out there. And we built on it by using photos. And so there's a lot of peer crowd research that uses uh, names and words um, or labels, as some, as some might call it. And early on, this is how we emulated this research. And we said, OK, what group is this? What do you call it? What do you call that group? What do you call this group? And what we found was that people were using different words to describe the same thing. What one person would call the friendly normal people, another person would call the weirdos. And it was just we could not get agreement on what these words meant. Um, and more so, we would go from one school to another, and there was even more disagreement about what the words meant. But they were describing the same things. They were telling us they liked, had the same interests, they went to the same places, they um, had the same clothing styles and things like that. So about eight years ago, we evolved from using words and we said, what if we just don't care what they're called? What if we just go by who they are and what they look like? And so we started uh, this uh, photo segmentation process, and how it works is, um, we give teens about 100 different photos of random, of random teens they've never met, and we said, if all these teens went to your school, who would hang out with who? And they organize the photos and they make piles. And they say, well, this is the so-and-so group, and this is the other group, and, and whatever that is. And then we take those piles from dozens and dozens of teens, and we put them into a social network analysis, and we look for consistent relationships between the photos themselves. And so we see which photos tend to be clumped together, and what is this group? Based on what we've heard from all these individual teens, how, how are they describing this group? Um, and so we pick some words just for us to be able to talk about it, but those words never end up on a survey. They never end up in front of the teen. All the teens ever see are the photos. So then now we have these groups, we have these photos. We go back to the focus groups and we gave them the photos and we said, okay, now tell us which group you belong to. And we start to try and find some alignment and we say, okay, People seem to agree that these photos represent a group that we're going to call hip-hop. They may call it 10 different things, but we're going to go ahead and call it hip-hop. And then we're looking at, all right, which teens self-selected and said, I'm a part of these photos. I'm, I'm in this group. And which were the photos that they were picking the most into their groups? So we're trying to, it's all a kind of a, a, a circle of trying to verify the photos with the same kids who are creating these groups by, at, by putting them on the spot and asking which photos best represent your group and making sure we're using the experts from within each group to tell us which photos represent what groups. 
And that's how we end up with our eye-based survey that I shared and with our photo-based segmentation, is we have these photos that represent these groups that all came from teens telling us this is what the groups are and this is what photos best represent those groups from a person who's a proud member of that group rather than someone who maybe doesn't understand it. Um, and so what groups have we found? Well, we have five groups that we consistently find around the country. The mainstream teens, alternative teens, country, hip-hop, and popular teens. So let's go through each of them. The first group is the mainstream teens. And the mainstream teens are the teens that every parent would love to have. Um, because these teens, they have a priority other than their social life um, that, mot that really motivates them. It could be their school, their sport, their after school program, their um, religion, their family, going to college, whatever it is. That thing's more important. And so what that means is that they're not willing to put that thing at risk through, their, uh, through social risk behaviors. So they avoid those social risk behaviors. Um, it doesn't mean they don't have a social life. They have a great social life. They just choose not to be, uh, they just don't need to be with the teens that are um, ex exposing themselves to a lot of risk. And so those are our mainstream teens. Then we have the popular teens. And the popular teens, these are the quintessential uh, American teenager. They are um, the cheerleader and the quarterback. They, they are fashionable. They like to be popular at school. They seek attention. They love Snapchat and Instagram. Um, and they have always been around. You can see them in the movie Grease. You can see them in the Breakfast Club. And you can see them today at your local high school. Um, they, are, they, they are pretty consistent in who they are and what they care about. Um, and one thing that sometimes gets confused is, is you, know, you hear these words, and they kind of sound like music genres and stuff. We're not saying that all the kids who listen to hip-hop are part of the hip-hop group and all the kids who listen to alternative are part of the alternative group. This group listens to all those things as long as it's popular. So it's not, it's not surf, so surface level where we can say it's just a music genre or it's just a clothing style. It's much deeper than that. Um, and these kids are all about what's cool, what's, what's current, what's the most popular thing that people are into. The next group we have is alternative teens. And these teens have a lot of subgroups like skater, rocker, hipster, emo, goth, etc. But they're all brought together by the idea that they're counterculture. Uh, they don't want to be like the popular teens. They uh, value individuality and creativity uh, more so than a lot of the other teens do. And they like to express that individuality and, and creativity. Um, and artisticness, et cetera. Um, and so they really also support the people within their culture who create these things. So they have a much closer relationship with local bands and local artists um, because it's, it's a part of, they see it as kind of an extension of their friend group, all these creators that they connect with, connect with within their culture. Then we have the country teens, and the country teens are all American, patriotic. Um, they tend to be uh, more outdoorsy. They like to go hunting and mudding, and they love their trucks. They like to wear camo to school. Um, they are uh, more traditionalists, so they uh, have a lot more of a hand-me-down culture from their parents than the other groups do. Um, and and they, are, they are overall more conservative. They're a bit more averse to change. You don't see as many, you know, if you looked at country peer crowd 10 years ago, probably looks almost exactly the same as it, as it does today um, because there's so much consistency in what, what it means to be a part of this group. And then lastly, we have hip hop culture. And hip hop culture is built around this idea that um, I'm overcoming a, a struggle that not necessarily all of my other peers are facing. Whether it's an environmental struggle in my neighborhood, um, struggles with my family, whatever it is, I am facing these struggles and I need to prove that I can overcome them. So there's a much stronger desire to, um, uh, to exude strength and success within this peer crowd, a lot more care about fashion and how you project yourself and that kind of machismo of saying like, I can overcome, I am strong, um, look, at, look at what I can do, um, despite the adversity that, that I have faced. And so these five peer crowds, no matter where we go in the country, um, we find at least a few kids who belong to each of them. What's different from community to community is their size. Um, and so in Oklahoma City, we might find a much bigger country group. Then if we go to LA, we might find a much bigger hip hop and alternative group. Um, but for the most part, the vast majority of norms are the same. Uh, being what it means to be hip hop in LA is, is from a value perspective, the same thing as what it means to be hip hop in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma or in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, there might be a few little tweaks to the fashion style and a few little tweaks to which artist is their favorite at the moment, but the core values of the group remain the same. And a lot of that consistency is because of mass media. These kids are consuming the same music, the same fashion, the same clothing stores, the same websites and channels and things like that. And so there's a lot of uniformity about what each of these groups represents and what their values are. 
So here is, um, here is the instrument that I mentioned earlier that we use to measure peer crowd affiliation. It's called the iBase survey. And so the IB survey is two pages. One page is all female photos, and the other one's all male photos. And teens are asked to pick the photos that best represent their main group of friends and, and worst represent their main group of friends. Um, and based on that, they get a score. And so like I said, they never see the words. So they never see the word hip hop or alternative or mainstream or anything like that. They just see photos that other teens told us represent those groups. And then we score them. So every teen who takes this survey gets a score in all five peer crowds and we find out which peer crowd is their strongest motivator and which other peer crowds have a minority influence on them as well. So we were fortunate enough to get it added on to the uh, Virginia Youth Risk Behavior Survey, thanks to our uh, wonderful client there in, at the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth. Um, it was in the 2015 survey and has also been included in the 2017 survey, but we're still, folks are still analyzing that data. So that's over 5,000 high school students random sampled across the state. Um, and uh, so I, I think you all know this is the survey that, that most states use from the CDC to measure risk behaviors. Um, and all we did was add the IBA survey at the very end. Um, and about 80% of the teens who took the survey completed that portion as well. And so we were able to know all sorts of risk behaviors and peer crowds. This is the distribution of Virginia peer crowds. We see uh, the green bars is the people who had the highest score in that group. So you can only be in one green bar. But the gray bar is any group that you got at least a positive score in. Right? So let's say that I got the, the score range is negative 12 to positive 12. So let's say that I got a 5 in mainstream, but I got a 2 in hip hop. What that would mean is that I'm in the mainstream green bar only, because I got the highest score in mainstream. But then I'm also in the mainstream gray bar, and I'm in the hip hop gray bar because I also had a positive score from hip hop. So the gray bar kind of gives us a sense of the broader reach of the peer crowd since teens are mixing cultures and mixing influences from different cultures. And so we see uh, popular is the biggest group at 35% uh, primary influence, 75% any influence, all the way down to alternative um, at about 6% primary influence and 11% any influence. So let's jump into the risk behavior. So what we saw in Virginia first, and all of the slides are going to be formatted the same way. We have the five groups at the bottom, popular, mainstream, hip hop, country, and alternative. Um, the pink bars are significantly um, uh, increased risk, and the green bars are significantly below risk. And we have the average percentage at the top. Uh, so current tobacco use was 22%. That means any tobacco product in the past 30 days. We see that hip hop teens were uh, at 36% likely to use, and alternative teens at 34%. So significantly increased risk of use, while the mainstream teens were only at 8%, so significantly less risk. But when we dive into the individual tobacco products, we see very unique patterns. Cigarette smoking is most popular amongst alternative teens. We see a 21% cigarette smoking rate compared to just a 8% overall cigarette smoking rate, so nearly three times the risk. Mainstream continues to be at, the, at lowest risk at 2.8%. But when we move to different products like cigarillos, it's hip hop teens that are most likely to have smoked a cigarillo in the past 30 days, 15% compared to just 7% overall. And then smokeless tobacco, chew tobacco, the average rate's 5%, but country teens are at 15% likely to use, so three times the risk. And look at mainstream teens, less than 1% use of chew amongst mainstream culture. When we look at hookah and e-cigarettes, hookah we see is primarily uh, a hip hop behavior, 18% uh, compared to just six and a half overall. And e-cigarettes we see a much broader distribution amongst the same risk group. So our highest risk group for e-cigarettes is 28% at hip hop, which is twice the average of 14%. But we also see elevated risk for alternative at 25% and country at 20%. What does that tell us? The same three groups that were at risk for some other tobacco product are also using and, ex and experimenting with e -cigs. We don't know which came first, but what we know is that it's the same teens. It's just all the tobacco product teens that are also open to using uh, e-cigarettes. Um, one of the things we often get asked about is, is well, um, you know, what exactly is, is the relationship? What about race? What about age? What about gender? And so this is a regression looking at controlling for demographics, so age, race, gender, um, 
and looking at the relationship between their peer crowd score, every point they go up on a peer crowd score, and how that affects their various tobacco products. And so what we see is that for every point that you go up on alternative, for example, your risk of smoking cigarette goes up 17%. And, every and for hip hop, it goes up 22%. So even though hip hop wasn't necessarily the highest for um, cigarette smoking, um, it was still a significantly associated with increased risk in cigarette smoking. In contrast, every point you add in your mainstream score, your risk goes down 43%. So parents, you know, another club, maybe that's another point on the mainstream scale. Um, you know, keep pushing, keep pushing it that way. Um, chew tobacco, we see it's uh, country elevates at 11%. And interestingly, we see hip hop is also contributing to spit tobacco use. And so we dug a little bit deep in there. This controls for gender and race, right? When you control for the fact that country teens are primarily white and prim primarily male, and you remove those two factors, which drive a lot of chewed tobacco use risk, what you're left with is just the peer crowd. And what we found was that hip hop teens in some of those same communities, white rural hip hop teens, are extremely likely to also be using chew. And so this looks at just the impact of the culture, right? Not controlling for the impact of, of race and controlling for the impact of of gender, so we see that hip hop also is contributing to chew tobacco use. And we see a similar pattern for cigarillos, um, e cigs we see alternative contributing as well as hip hop, and any tobacco use um, alternative in hip hop culture. And so overall, um, being popular uh, doesn't really affect your risk of tobacco use very much. You're kind of in the middle. Uh, but if you're mainstream, your risk goes down. If you're country, overall your risk goes down, except for chew tobacco. But if you're hip hop you're, or alternative, your risk for tobacco use goes up with every point that you're added in that peer crowd. But let's move on to some other behaviors. So here we have um, binge drinking and marijuana use. Binge drinking average rate of 11%. We see it's 17% for hip hop teens. Marijuana use is 15.8% in the state. And we see it's 34% for hip hop teens. And we see a significantly low level for both mainstream and country. So that's something interesting going on there. Country teens have risk behaviors, but for some reason marijuana is not one of their, it's actually a protective factor against marijuana use being country, which is interesting. Um, then we have took a prescription drug without a doctor's prescription. We see hip hop teens nearly double the risk, 14.7% compared to seven and a half. Um, and close also elevated risk for alternative at 11%. And then we see took over the counter drugs to get high, just 4% of teens did that, but it was 10.5% 10 10 of hip hop teens who did it and 11.5% of alternative teens who did it. So again, we're seeing concentration of risk within specific groups. And reported that there is at least one teacher or other adult in their school that they can talk to if they have a problem. This was really interesting. Uh, country teens actually feel like they have a lot of connections to the adults in their school. That may have to do with there is a relationship between country and, and kind of where you live and so rural schools maybe have a little bit smaller class sizes or something like that, that might contribute to it. But what is also interesting is that alternative and hip hop teens are less likely to feel they have a relationship with a parent. So we have 62.5% uh, of alternative teens reported feeling sad or hopeless compared to 25% average. Right, so, uh, so two and a half uh, times the risk there. Significantly less likely for country teens don't feel very sad. And popular teens, of course, uh, don't feel too sad there. Um, and agree that they feel good about themselves. The popular teens love themselves. 76.7% um, of them agreed they feel good about themselves, while only 33.6% of alternative teens uh, feel, that, feel good about themselves and say they feel good about themselves. And so what does that contribute to? Well, um, it's, it's correlated with suicide attempts. And so we see that alternative teens are more than three times more likely than the average teen to have uh, attempted, uh, made a plan about how they would commit suicide. 34.5% of alternative teens say they have made a plan for suicide. How scary is that number? 34.5% compared to 10.8% overall. And then when we look at actual suicide attempts, we see 17.8% of alternative teens have at some point attempted suicide. And hip hop, 11% of hip hop teens have also attempted suicide. We saw it's actually an elevated risk here for the plan as well. It just didn't pop up to significance. Um, and popular teens are the least likely to have made a suicide attempt. Um, and a lot of times what we see 
we're in a physical fight. Uh, hip hop teens uh, were about uh, one and a half times more likely to have been in a physical fight, 33% compared to 19.7%. Were threatened or injured with a weapon though, alternative teens, 13% of them, were threatened or injured with a weapon at school. More than double the, the, rate, the overall rate of 5%. Did not participate in 60 minutes of physical activity, at least once a day. Uh, again, our hip hop and alternative teens are also not physically active. So we have 23% and 25% compared to 16% overall. And we see that popular teens are the most active. Only 9% of them said they did not participate in 60 minutes of physical activity. And when we look at the next question, which is participated on a sports team, we get a clue as to why. 72% of popular teens have participated on a sports team um, compared to just 57% of teens overall. And the least likely group to be on a sports team is the alternative group at 30%. Now, sedentary activity, we see it's both hip hop and alternative doing it, but they're doing different things when they're being sedentary. What are they doing? Hip hop teens are more likely to be watching TV, three or more hours of TV a day, while alternative teens are more likely to be on their computer. So even kind of how the risk is manifesting is different for different peer crowds. Um, drink a bottle or a can of soda, it was country teens who are drinking the most soda at 31% compared to just 16.7% overall, so nearly double the risk, and then were obese. So only 12.9% of Virginia teens are obese, it's 28% of country teens in Virginia, more than double the risk. Right? So, and we've seen the pattern. We see it's sedentary activity, um, we see that it's uh, um, drinking soda, etc. So, so it's all kind of written in here. Um, when we sought out to include this on the YRBS, we actually didn't expect this many relationships between peer crowds and, and uh, risk behaviors, and we were surprised by just how many behaviors are influenced by which peer crowd you identify with. So a separate study that we did, we did a national survey, um, a national online survey of teens to understand teen pregnancy risk. Um, and what we found here was that hip hop teens um, were most likely to have either um, uh, uh, there's a battery of questions of measuring your risk of pregnancy, um, and hip hop teens scored on that battery. 39% of them were at risk based on that battery, um, compared to just 6% of alternative was actually our lowest risk group for teen pregnancy. Um, and when we dove deep into that, there's a number of troubling statistics. So um, hip hop teens were more likely to anticipate positive effects from teen pregnancy than other peer crowds. In particular, they were more significantly, significantly more likely to expect to feel excited, more grown up if they became a parent as a teen. So the hip hop group here is the green bar across the three. So they were most likely to agree that they would feel closer to their partner, most likely to say they would feel excited and to feel more grown up um, by a pretty big uh, margin compared to the other peer crowds. And so you see kind of even culturally within the hip hop peer crowd, there's something different going on about what teen pregnancy means within that group. So, an interesting thing that, we're, that we've been talking about, particularly with, the, with Virginia, where this data is coming from, is public health, for the most part, talks about these behaviors in silos. And we say, well, here's our tobacco prevention campaign. Here's our alcohol prevention campaign. Where's our opioids prevention campaign? Let's start one of those. But what we're seeing is that it's the same kids. It's the same kids who are at risk for most of these risk behaviors. Hip hop teens tend to be more at risk for um, substance use. And alternative kids tend to be more at risk for, um, for mental health and depression. And so we see this relationship. And, and so the question is, well, rather than kind of bounce between whatever the current thing that has funding is, the current thing that's most uh, you know, kind of buzzworthy within politics and the government, um, can we start to create strategies that build the public health asset within the peer crowd in this culture, something that is hip hop, that represents hip hop and represents being healthy within hip hop, that can have its message ebb and flow, but can continue to build um, its, its brand, rather than one year be this, another year switch, and now we're talking about something else, and we've kind of lost all the progress we made with the previous campaign. Because it's not about the individual behaviors, it is about the culture and what the culture means. And so, you might be asking, well, so what is this? Is this because of the music they listen to? Is this because of the clothing they wear, et cetera? We think this is way deeper than that. Um, our theory of peer crowds is that peer crowds come from life experiences. Life experiences, uh, early childhood experiences, shape a teen's worldview. 
And so the teen looks at the world a certain way, um, they develop their attitudes and values based on that, and then when they go into late middle school, high school, when we start to see peer crowds emerge, they find other teens who share that worldview. And so it's not that being hip hop makes you at risk, it's that when you have experienced these risks throughout your life and when you have a certain worldview, you align yourself with others who agree with that, and it's these, the risky young people who, um, who grew up and chose that peer crowd rather than another one because they identified with those same uh, beliefs. But then, unfortunately, the behaviors are perpetuated because public health tends to not be in the high-risk peer crowds. Public health tends to live within the mainstream group um, when we look at our, our media, our messages, our programs, et cetera. And so we've been wanting to test this theory for a long time, and we still do not yet have a longitudinal study that follows kids from you know, age five all the way up to 18. But what we do have is we were recently able to add um, the adverse childhood experiences scale onto a peer crowd study. And so if you haven't heard of this scale, um, it's a zero to nine scale used on the National Survey of Children's Health. This is the one that gets asked to the kids themselves. So there's another one that's used with adults to kind of go all the way back to their childhood. It's a bit more uh, probing. This one's a little bit lighter to, to work with, with teenagers. And so the questions are, you know, experienced household financial difficulty, uh, divorced or separated parents, parent or guardian died, parent or guardian served time in jail, um, heard parents or adults uh, in violence within uh, another one's home, live with someone who is mentally ill, suicidal, or severely depressed, live with someone who had a drug or alcohol problem, experienced witness violence in their neighborhood, and was treated or judged unfairly because of their race or ethnicity. So um, as far as we know, this is the first time that uh, peer crowds and adverse childhood experiences have been looked at, so you guys are, this is hot off the presses. Um, and what we're seeing is that the more adver uh, the teens who identify with hip hop and alternative peer crowds had experienced more adverse childhood experiences um, than teens who identified with other peer crowds. In fact, we see that the lowest peer crowd, we were expecting it to be mainstream, mainstream's pretty low, but the lowest peer crowd is actually country followed by popular. So the fewer experiences you have, um, the more likely you're be, you are to be within those groups. The more experiences you have, the more likely you are to be with those other groups. And that speaks to that peer crowds is not just the clothes you're wearing. Peer crowds is a belief system. It's I have experienced this in my life, and so now this is how I look at the world. And someone needs to speak to me from that lens, from the context of what I've experienced. And so as we dig deeper, um, controlling for demographics, a one point increase on the ACE score was associated with a 16% increase in odds to be hip hop and a 20% increase in odds of identifying as alternative. So every adverse childhood experience that a, a child had increased their, their, uh, their likelihood of identifying with those peer crowds. And every uh, fewer, um, and every adverse experience that they had also decreased their risk uh, by 8% of identifying with popular. And then further, we, we are exploring another theory, which is that, is there a difference between home-based adverse experiences and environment-based, neighborhood-based adverse experiences? And we are seeing the beginning of a trend here. So home experiences where anything like household financial difficulty, divorce, parent died, served jail, jail time, et cetera, and the environmental experiences where witness violence in the neighborhood, treated unfairly because of race, ethnicity, et cetera, and we do see a pattern. Home-based adverse experiences are more associated with being alternative, while environment-based adverse experiences are more associated with being hip-hop. Um, and so, in fact, for every point, for every additional home, or every additional environmental um, experience that someone has, increases their odds of being hip-hop by 61%, right? We call it the struggle. And now we finally see you know, exactly what that means and how that connects to, to culture in a, in a, in a data, data way. Because unfortunately, we can't go to medical directors and say, well, have you heard of the struggle? But we can tell them, we can show them the data. So what does is, what is the geography of culture mean? It's like looking at a topography of peer crowds. So imagine that peer crowds, teens are, are fish. Imagine we're in the Little Mermaid. Teens are fish. They're living in an ocean and they're swimming around and everything's kind of flowing. And yes, we have the hip hop teens over here and we have the alternative teens over here, but there's, there's, it's one big ocean, right? Everyone's flowing, everyone's kind of talking. 
And so a lot of teens mix peer crowds, and a lot of teens draw influence from multiple peer crowds. And so we wanted to somehow map that. Can we track where exactly peer crowds are flowing and how that flow is actually happening? So what we did is we took popular, we put it in the center because that's the group that overlaps with the most peer crowds. And then we put the peer crowds around it. And then we said, we're going to make boxes for all of the mixes, right? So here's popular, here's hip hop, and here's popular and hip hop. Here's mainstream, here's popular, here's hip hop, here's popular, mainstream, and hip hop. So teens were put into the group based on what mix they had. And what we found was that most teens ended up in the middle. So yes, we had 3.5% of teens in hip hop, 4% that were exclusively popular, but most teens were here. 12.7% were both popular and hip hop. 21% were both popular and mainstream. 14% um, were popular mainstream and country. 11% popular mainstream in hip hop. So we see this belt right here is where most teens live. So most teens are not an extreme version of hip hop or an extreme version of country. They're mixing something in the middle. And this is very useful because what we see is, well, hey, there's mainstream teens that are doing risk behaviors. There's popular teens that are doing risk behaviors. Why? Where does that come from? This helps us start to kind of tease that out and separate and understand where it's coming from. So for example, when we looked at cigarette smoking, we saw a very clear pattern. Cigarette smoking is coming from hip hop culture and it's coming from alternative culture and spreading uh, throughout popular and country cultures while mainstream culture is pushing and creating a protective factor. Right? So it's, like, it's a map, it's a guide as to where is this risk behavior. And so this is why, imagine, you know, we've talked, we talked a lot about uh, mainstream youth in, in advertising. Not only does it reach the wrong group, but imagine it here, right? Who's paying attention to the mainstream ad? It's this kid. This kid just can't, can't go into these groups and cause change. In order to be most effective, we have to go into this group. We need to go into this group. It's just like an epidemiologist is fighting a virus. We're just fighting a social virus. We need to find the epicenter, just like someone needs to find the epicenter of Ebola, right? It's, it's the same thing. It's just we're talking about human beings and shared culture rather than shared germs. Cigarillo smoking is more exclusive, a more exclusive pattern coming from hip hop culture with a bit of a protective factor from, uh, from even alt a little bit playing a protective role, definitely mainstream. Um, and, and we see almost a perfect pattern kind of moving across uh, the center there. Chewed tobacco use is the opposite pattern. We see if you're exclusively country, you have a 27% chewed tobacco use rate. If you're country and popular, you have a 19% chewed tobacco use rate. And if you're just popular, you have a 12% chewed tobacco use rate. So we can look at this and say, hey, there's a, there's a big chew rate in popular, we should target them. But what this tells us is, no, maybe we might not have been able to capture the little bit of country influence in here, but it's clear that we're seeing a flow. And if we don't stop this flow over here, we're not going to really be able to do a lot about the risk that's in here. And that's, and that's what that pattern kind of helps us understand. E-cigs and vaping, a lot more orange and red, but we still see a similar pattern. Hip hop's driving the strongest e-cig influence, but we still have a pretty huge rate over at country and alternative also driving big, big rates. And marijuana use, uh, we see a more narrow influence coming from hip hop culture. We see both country and mainstream serving as a bit of a protective factor, um, but even hip hop pushing into mainstream a bit through these uh, mainstream and hip hop mixes. An alternative is a little bit elevated, but not as much as, as, as we would expect. So a lot of times we think of someone smoking weed, you might picture a hip hop kid, you might also picture like a skater emo kid. We don't see that as strong as we see um, hip hop driving marijuana use. So uh, to, to wrap up, um, how do we change this? Uh, changing cultural norms starts with just understanding what those norms are, which we've done, and then creating an intervention that, that fits within that culture. So social branding is our strategy to do that, and it's a behavior change marketing strategy that utilizes a peer crowd targeted brand to associate a healthy behavior with a peer crowd value. So here's a bit of what that looks like. Uh, it's three components. The first component is the image, voice, and personality of the brand. It has to match the culture that we're trying to change. Otherwise, they won't trust us. They won't even look at us. They won't even notice us, right? A lot of times we think it's that teens don't like something. We're really fighting for attention. And if you don't look like their friends, they're probably not even going to notice your campaign. 
So brand equity and brand awareness comes from targeting the right group and showing their culture authentically. But then we need to associate our behavior with something they care about. And that's where um, the middle comes in. KAB stands for knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. We need to tell them that this achieves what they want better. It's all about them. It's all about their values and how our health behavior can help them achieve what they want. And then lastly, we use events, diverse voices, engagements, influencers. However much we can do, however, however far the budget can go, we try and get real people as a part of the campaign to change perceived norms. Because perceived norms is kind of that trigger, right? You, you start to see it, you start to tell yourself, I should change, but then you're like, oh shoot, I gotta change because everyone around me is changing. Uh, because I'm seeing all these voices telling me that they don't do this. I thought they did. Now I'm learning they don't. So I need to start changing. People I look up to do it. And it's those three things combined that we theorize causes behavior change. And when we talk about values, there's huge value differences across these peer crowds. And that's why segmentation is so critically important. Um, for example, here we have, um, I am a patriotic person. 71% of country teens say they are a patriotic person. Only 27% of hip hop teens say they are a patriotic person, right? And so that's a big question. Depending on which group you're targeting, you may or may not want to throw your American flag all over the, the ad. Um, I'm a religious person. Again, we're seeing country with strongest alternative at the lowest, at 30%. Over here, I care about the environment. 82% of alternative teens care about the environment. Only 59% of country teens do. So again, depending on what your issue is and what the message, um, you, you have to pick the value that matches. This, is real, this one's really interesting because we start to get into music and fashion and the different relationships different peer crowds have. Um, the first question, I stay up to date with the latest music and musicians. We see that 67% of hip hop teens and 64% of popular teens agree with that. But when we move to, I go out of my way to support local music and artists, both of those drop and who do we see that remains up there? It's alternative teens with 45% of them. So alternative teens are about that local rock band while hip hop and popular teens are about what's big, what's, ha what's happening online, who, who do I need to know about? Clothing is really interesting too. I use clothes to express my identity. The highest group, alternative at 69%, followed by hip hop at 60%. But when we change the question a little, I care about being fashionable, alternative teens drop down to 43% and it's hip hop teens at the top with 59% and popular teens at 54%. So their relationship with fashion is different. Um, I care about keeping my body free from toxins and unhealthy substances. Interestingly, Hip hop teens agree with this. 69% agree with this. 69% of mainstream teens agree with this as well, while only 43% of country teens agree with this. So huge differences in values. So peer crowds, it's not just about music. It's not just about clothing. It is about deep beliefs and, and what, they care, uh, what they care about. So the biggest problem, as we talked yesterday, is that without using segmentation, we end up reaching the lowest at-risk youth. Um, and so I'm going to show you an example. This is from one of our clients from before they hired us. Um, and so I have permission from them to use it so, so we can talk about them. Um, so this is uh, from Virginia. So we, I, I can share a little bit more of, of, of the inside knowledge. It's about pretty old. It's about a 10-year-old 10 year, 10 year old ad. And um, they really liked the ad. And the ad's funny. The ad gets your attention. When they did message recall on it, a lot of recall from teens. A lot of people were seeing it. They thought it was gross. They thought it was funny. But when they started asking deeper questions about the brand, guess who liked the brand the most? The mainstream teens did. Right? And the people who didn't really like the brand and had felt no connection with the brand were the high risk groups. The alternative teens, the country teens, and the hip hop teens were like, that doesn't, that doesn't connect with me at all. And so sometimes something that may even be getting a decent reception online because people think it's funny, it's entertaining, may not actually be hitting any of the buttons to cause change within the groups that need that change because as we know, not all teens are the same. And what we also know is that when we go all the way back to the beginning, we talked about the tobacco industry, the tobacco industry uses different brands to reach different people. And this is something that happens across commercial marketing that we just don't do very much of in public health. 
We want to reach everybody with one brand. Sometimes it's, or maybe most of the time, it's because our budget can only afford one campaign, but we can cause more impact by targeting a single group with the one campaign we can afford than by watering down our campaign and trying to reach everybody with our limited resources. And so just like RJ Reynolds and Philip Morris know that Cool reaches a whole different audience than Camel and a whole different one than Winston, we need to understand what brands do we have, who are we reaching with it, and next time we have funding, next time we have an opportunity to do more, what's the next group we need to reach with it? We don't have to reach everybody at once with, with a single brand. And so when we started working with Virginia, that was the question was, well, we have three groups that are at high risk, how do we reach them? Um, and so we have two different strategies in Virginia. We have one strategy, which is our policy change strategy that is supported by our youth engagement program called Y Street. Y Street's fabulous, fantastic, is changing policy left and right, but those teens are our mainstream teens for the most part. A few popular teens in there, a few from other groups. They're fantastic, they're convincing adults to cause change, um, but they're, we're not gonna go and tell them to go to a hip hop concert and try and convince those teens to stop smoking, right? It's just, it, it's, it's not the, the strongest strategy. So we do great work over there with policy change with amazing youth, but then we have our culture change strategies. And our culture change strategies are focusing on alternative teens, country teens, and hip hop teens. Um, and hip hop teens happens to be an amplification of the federal uh, FDA campaign, Fresh Empire. So we uh, made that connection there so we didn't uh, waste funds recreating something that's already um, out in market. So first, for country teens, we know that they're patriotic, enjoy outdoors, they have strong and broad family ties, uh, traditionalists, strong pass-me-down culture, and they enjoy tinkering with machines and fixing things like trucks and four-wheelers. And so based on this, we made, uh, here is what that message looks like. Some people call this a hack. We just call it fixed. Need a shower? Got one. Hungry at a barbecue? Grab a rake. Always dreamt of a pool? Grab a tarp. Yeah, there's a quick fix to just about anything, but there ain't no fix for dip. Why? Because that dipping and chewing leads to losing your teeth and gum disease. And there ain't no quick fix to a broke down smile. And that's why I live tobacco free. All right, so we found something online called Redneck Hacks um, that country teens proudly post all the things that they fix with duct tape. Um, and how cool they think that is and how much they love that, right? I don't have to buy something new, I will just create this whole thing out of a roll of duct tape. So we said, well, can we leverage that and can we show that, yeah, we can fix all sorts of things. We are country too. We can all fix these things, but the one thing we can't fix is we can't put duct tape in our mouth, right? We can't, we can't just fix these falling teeth with, with, uh, with our hacks. Um, and so uh, this had did, did very well, got a lot of attention, got a lot of conversation because it fit right into uh, what the culture was already talking about. And interestingly, with uh, country culture, what we see is that they like a specific kind of message. They like people talking to the camera. They want it to go slower. They don't want to have a lot of fancy, flashy cuts. When we've shown them ads from kind of more, let's call them metropolitan uh, campaigns, um, they get confused. And they're like, I didn't even know what that was for. There was too many flashing lights and music and loud, and I, I don't know what's going on. And so even the production style for different groups is different. Um, which is just kind of goes to show the power of, the, of these spirit crowds. So next we have hip hop teens. Um, you've heard a lot about Fresh Empire, so I'll just jump right in to show you one. One thing that we see is hip hop teens are constantly seeking to take control of their lives. Um, there's a lot that's out of their control and we just saw it with the adverse uh, childhood experiences. They want to take control and that's what we leverage with Fresh Empire. You see, my mom's double shift wasn't in vain. Low achiever, at risk, disregard it. I will break that chain. Pain, disease, death, cigarettes were to blame. But I overcame the blot. And the shock when my grandpa's lung cancer caused by cigarettes was caught. Distraught and left alone. Had three generations in one home. Not broken, but awoken. Setting sights on CEO of independence as my goal. So I reject cigarettes to regain control. Keep it fresh. Live tobacco free. So there's a lot in there, but it's all about you know, the, the hip hop story. It's all about these are the, this is the adversity that my family uh, faces, and this is how me being tobacco free connects to me overcoming these things that I am so proud to have overcome. And, and a lot of Fresh Empire messaging is about that control, about that success, and how being tobacco free plays into that. And the last one I'll show you is Psych. And so Psych um, is, is Virginia's alternative rock uh, uh, tobacco prevention program. Psych, because alternative teens, they're a lot more skeptical of flashy commercial marketing. They want to hear from people like them. 
they don't want to see you trying to trick them. They, 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 they snuff out kind of uh, frauds really, really quickly. So we work with a lot of bands. And fortunately, because the program is so cool and so authentic, a lot of bands are willing to work with us, a lot of big name bands. And so let me show you just a quick uh, web video of what Psych looks like. Psych supports the most awesome, the amazing, greatest, craziest shows in Virginia. I think Psych's pretty cool, dude. Psych promotes a smoke-free scene in Virginia. We're not against smokers. We're exposed to the truth of what the tobacco industry does to our world. I think it's awesome that there's people and foundations out there that support smoke-free scenes. Why do I support Psych? The industry blatantly targets women like me and their marketing. Because 50,000 people die every year from secondhand smoke. Tobacco contributes to global deforestation. Big tobacco companies use music as a tool, and personally I think that's bullshit. We don't like any industry that's trying to manipulate our scene. Because it's disgusting, it stains your teeth, and it can kill you. They don't care about the customer at all. The tobacco company testing on animals is horrible. I'm like a big dog lover. So what kind of bands does Psych work with? Any band that supports the smoke-free scene. Like us, I Declare War. I Declare War supports a smoke-free scene. Hey, I'm Danny from Upon a Burning Body. I'm Matt from In the Midst of Lions. I'm Jake from In the Midst of Lions, and I support Psych. All right, we'll cut it off there because we're at time. Um, but as you can see, you learned that bands love morbid names and um, that we can really kind of connect those bands with an authentic movement. And what we've seen from these social branding programs um, is a lot of success within those groups that we're trying to reach. Um, and so you can find a number of published studies from some of our young adult work with Crush, Commune, and Havoc, each targeting young adult peer crowds for tobacco prevention. Um, and then Psych uh, and Down and Dirty um, publications are, are rolling as well. And we hope one day to add Fresh Empire to that list too once that evaluation is finished. Um, and so uh, that's it, we are, we are right at time. So I'm gonna stand up here and continue to answer questions, but if you need to run off and grab a snack, please feel free to. Thank you very, oh, and, and do your evaluation cards before you leave. Thank you very much.